Thank y'all for coming. This is fun. Uh, no, seriously, y'all are all friends of mine. I love this. So here's the deal. I'm going to talk, and when something doesn't make sense, you're going to need to say, I don't understand. And let me try to explain it because I want to go all the way through this and get, have you really get a good idea about what's going on with the Iris Garden and the Centennial Iris Garden, how it came about, where we're going with it. And uh, I hope it's all exciting. And if you've got the handouts, I'll be coming to those eventually. But here we are. There's the... Uh, the sneak peek at the Centennial Iris Garden, and I've got three parts I'm going to cover with you here. One of memories of the original garden. Quick, how many of y'all just conjured up a memory of the original garden? Yeah, baby. Okay, yeah. So many of you knew the original garden. We're going to talk on number two about what is the Dykes Medal. Anybody know what the Dykes Medal is, sort of, maybe? No, okay, I'm gonna be doing some teaching, some instruction, and then we're gonna do a peek at the members of the new Iris Garden. Okay, memories of the original garden. Time out. Iris has existed back in ancient Greek culture, okay? There were people bringing Dr. J.W. Hunt irises for his home. I am not wanting to offend anybody by saying that the first irises ever planted at this particular university were in that garden. Okay, irises were very popular through that time. So with that said, let's kind of jump, and you can tell, and I could recognize quickly because that's a 1962 Chevy Biscayne in the back. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's old, it's been used. So somewhere in the 60s. Okay, now, some of you may remember a little bit more from the views looking at Radford. Oh, you're smiling and remembering, isn't it great? Isn't it great? And some of you in here knew Dr. Norlin Henderson. Anybody? Yeah. All right. We got him. Okay. Dr. Norlin Henderson. Now, I want to start with him because he really was the dude that got this thing started. Okay. Dr. Henderson, in 1961, got permission to start the garden. He was a brand new rookie professor here, biology professor, and he was a hybridizing botanist. <coughs> means he took something from this flower and something from this flower and put it together and eventually it grew and they looked to say, well, did this turn out like we thought we would? Or are we pleasantly surprised? Or are we going to try again? So that's what I mean when I say hybridizing. They take a part from this and a part from that and they put it together and it comes out something new. Okay, he was a hybridizing botanist. He populated that garden with what's called a ward of merit. Don't hold that thought for too long. Just know that there are irises that get awards, and he populated that garden with award of merit irises. He also used some of his own experiments out there in the garden. So there were some of Dr. Henderson's hybridizations out there. Does that look like a mug shot or what? <laughs> okay, welcome. Now, I have learned a lot about Dr. Henderson, and I hope that uh, you'll share this with me. He lived to be 100. Wow. Yes, 1915-2016. He was a World War II vet, United States Army. He also had a doctorate at Florida State University. And he founded, after he left McMurray, the Award of Merit Iris Garden at Powell Gardens in Kansas City. Bobble your heads. Okay, everybody? Okay, so he took that love up there, and they still have that. And this picture is of him wearing his volunteer badge at the Powell Gardens because he would show up in April to tell everybody about the Award of Merit irises. His love for botany was also used. He was a professor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City for 24 years until his retirement in 1988. And then they said he was at the gardens all the time there. Uh, I have been in touch with the folks at the Powell Gardens for a number of reasons, and I'll tell you a little bit about it, but they loved Dr. Norlin Henderson. So their game was make Murray's Law on this. But he was a published classical botanist, okay? He was one of those that got all the articles in the journals and had numerous awards for his contributions in the area, not just related to irises, but others as well. And one of his, now from now on I'm going to call it AIS, but you're going to know it as the American Iris Society. Bobble your heads. Okay, everybody. Okay, American Iris Society. One of his colleagues, Jim Hedgecock, 
who's on my list of 50 people to call when I start wanting irises, owns Comanche Acres in Missouri, and he honored Dr. Henderson in 2001 by hybridizing this iris right here and naming it Dr. Norlin Henderson. Oh. Yeah, go, oh, oh, yeah, there you go. Now, Dr. Henderson also bred and registered in 1980 an iris called Dr. Joe. Wait, wait. But it appears to be obsolete. Oh, come, yeah. Now, okay. Now, how do I know that? Because I've been looking through Earth and around trying to find it. But if you were to go to the American Irish Society Wikipedia, you would see that Dr. Joe was created right here in 76. It was registered with an R, and then it was introduced. Okay, in 1980. Introduced means he had enough of it to offer it to sell. Okay, so from there, uh, it gets real blank. There are no references for us and there's no images found. No one has taken a picture of it. Did you know about this, Joe? No. Oh, are you learning too? Okay. <laughs> By the way, give a hand up here. This is Joe Humphrey Jr. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Show the love. Okay. Anyway, when you can't find pictures of it and nobody's referring back to it, they don't have it in their gardens. So I was just like crushed. So I contacted a hybridizer and said, if you ever get something together, you know, and it needs a name, why don't you call it Dr. Joe? <laughs> and he said, I can't, Pug, the name's already taken. Oh, that's really sad now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. But he hybridized these two. This one is an iris called Blue Petticoats, and he mixed it up with this one. And I know how much Dr. Joe loved this one. This was the Dykes Award winner in 1968 called Stepping Out. And I know how much Dr. Joe loved that one because that's the one he showed me. April 1970, sitting on the steps of Radford with all my pledge sisters, and some of them are here right now, and he's telling us about the iris garden, and he picks up stepping out, and he's saying, what do you think of this one? And I remember in my mind, I'm going, that is the most beautiful flower I've ever seen in my life. And trust me, growing up in Stanton, Texas, it was the most beautiful flower I had ever seen in my life, okay? Yeah, it was. Truly was. But anyway, the flower Dr. Joe, the Powell Garden has been looking for me all over the place and they can't seem to find it, which is sad. But when Dr. Nolan Henderson left McMurray for Kansas City, he left two things behind. The Iris Garden and a really very loyal friend. Wow. Yep. Because here we go, and y'all know where this one's going. Dr. Joe Humphrey, 1908, 1996, and I call him the consummate energetic educator. Who all had Dr. Joe for class? Yes, you agree with me? Huh? Consummate energetic. Yep. Yes, he was. Okay, graduate of Luling. I didn't know that till I started researching it. Okay, added degrees, Southwestern for bachelor's, SME for master's, and then George Peabody for his doctorate. Isn't that cool? Ah, oh, there might be other things you don't know about Dr. Cho. Although I bet his son could tell us a lot. Okay. Prior to his collegiate tenure, okay, and kind of sandwiched in between it a little bit, he taught in Abilene and became principal at Abilene High School, but he took a leave of absence when he was there to be in the state legislature. Y'all knew this, no? You didn't, Terry? Shame on you. Three two-year terms from 41 to 47. Okay, so he was serving the state legislature, and his committees included boards of education and state preservation. Am I not surprised? Yeah, I, at those kind of commitments. Yeah, that's Dr. Joe. That's Dr. Joe. All right. Now, we called him Dr. Joe. Did anybody ever say Dr. Humphrey? Anybody? No. Which is why, in my 42 years at McMurray, when they started just saying, Dr. Pug, I thought, you know, they called him Dr. Joe, they can call me Dr. Pug. I'm not going to get bent out of shape about it. And sometimes it was just, hey, Pug. Okay. <laughs> but at McMurray, he was academic dean, administrative assistant to the president, professor of education, 27 years, and there's two different stints there involved in it. And then this beautiful one to add to his memory. He cared for that garden for 30 years. 
That's called a pregnant pause for drama. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to let that soak in. Of course, he only had to walk across the street and up a little bit to get to the Iris Garden. And his own home across on sales just uh, south of Aldersgate had a lot of irises as well. But Dr. Joe has a lot of memories with a lot of us in the family. This is my family photos with Dr. Joe. It was 1980. Driving by one day, and I happened to have a camera. That's before cell phones had them. <laughs> for our cell phones, period. And I got the picture of him checking roll, carrying that, that notebook. Everybody remembers him checking. And then that's Ricky's old pickup in the back. Rick, yeah, you are. There you are. And that's, uh, I think Brad would have been, that's our three-year-old son in 1980. Yeah, right there with Dr. Joe in the garden. And there, a lot of us have those photos. That one right there pretty much takes the cake. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Come on, go. Oh, 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 it is so good. All right, the rest of the story pretty quick on this slide. Don't want to dwell on it too much. Dr. Joe died in 96. The garden went into some disrepair, and it was destroyed in 2007 to make way for a new building. And efforts to relocate irises on campus failed. Uh, my blood pressure medicine works fine in the morning. Don't, don't dwell on this one a whole lot. I can promise you I asked questions, I got answers, but the actions did not meet the answers. I, and I still think I should have done more things. But anyway, I, let's move on. Let's move on. Now, part two. DYKES, the Dykes Medal winners from the American Iris Society. Now, I really want you to catch this. This is huge. This is huge. It's like having a national champion. There is one Dykes winner every year. Well, except for 2021. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay. All right. Only one Dykes Award given every year by the American Iris Society. So if you were wanting to take from the award of merit irises and pick the best, it would be the Dykes winner. Bobble your heads. Y'all see where this is going? So rather than having to worry about an acre of irises, you could probably have a centennial garden with close to 80 of them representing botanical progression. Okay, are you with me? In a uh, smaller area and perhaps a little bit able to control a little better. Okay, everybody, all right, y'all are good. Okay, who was Dykes? You knew I had to get into the college professor oh, sure. thing. Because after all, now that I've retired from it, I realize that college professors are paid to know mundane facts. <laughs> and so you are sitting here, and I'm going to give you some mundane facts. Okay, William Rickinson Dykes. Okay, he was English, an amateur botanist. That was not his training. He was in the classics. He became an expert in the field of iris breeding and wrote several influential books on the subject. Bobble your heads. Okay. His enduring fame is based not on the irises that he created, but on the works that he did for scholarship. He was the epitome of the educator. Bobble your heads. Okay. And then, he was also interested in tulips, amaryllis, and other plants, but I'm not even going to talk about that. Let's just move on. Okay. So, <laughs> he was born in London. Okay, November 4th, coming up on his birthday, 1877. And this one I had to share with you. He worked worked as a teacher in Charterhouse School in London, 1903 to 1919, and that interested me because John Wesley attended Charterhouse Boarding School 200 years prior to that, okay, yeah, so I thought that was cool. He was then appointed to be, it was the gardening ch charity, the secretary of the Royal Horticulture Society, as only the English could do. That's right. Yes, jolly good, jolly good. In 1924, he married Elisa, they called her Catherine Kay, who excelled herself in hybridization, and she was also a painter, and she did illustrations of irises in a lot of the books. Okay, next thing. If you didn't do the math real quick, he's 47 when he got married. That's interesting, isn't it? Okay, now, Pug does research. Sadly, he died at the age of 48, 1925. Oh, thank y'all for feeling my pain. Okay, yeah. Okay, not only that, I have a quote from Nature Magazine of his death. We regret to record the untimely death of Mr. William Ricketson Dykes, Secretary of the Royal Horticulture Society, at the early age of 48 years. Now, I'll translate some of this. Motoring with his wife near walking, 
London suburb, okay? His car skidded, collided with a lorry, big truck, big truck, okay, lorry, and he was thrown out, sustaining severe injuries to his ear and right arm. Attempts to save the latter failed, and he died of syncope. I'm going, you fainted and you died? Okay, following, I think it was more the amputation of his arm at the shoulder on December 1. I think that would do it, don't y'all? So the world was without William Knox. Now, you got to go with me on this little trip now. So who was Sir Michael Foster? Aha, English physiologist. Aha, he organized the Cambridge Biological Society. And lo and behold, he met Oxford student William R. Dykes and instilled in him the love of irises. Hold that thought a minute. What did Norlin Henderson do to Joe Humphrey, his friend? Yeah. Yeah, it's called mentoring. Yeah, and so what did Michael Foster do yeah, to William Dykes. It's like, this kid needs something to do. <laughs> so upon his death, Dykes received all of Foster's notes and a comprehensive study of irises that he'd been unable to complete before his death, 1907. And in two years, upstart William R. Dykes had the book published. And I've got a copy of it at home. Yeah, yeah, I got it. All right, so. The mentoring takes place, it goes. Now some postscripts to this story on William Dykes. In June of 1926, just six months after his death, the British Iris Society says we're gonna make an award to recognize the best hybridizers just like he would have wanted us to. Sounds great, doesn't it? Okay, are we gonna do it in England? Well, sure, but currently they give Dykes medals to Great Britain, Australia, and New Zealand expanded England, okay? Now, the American Iris Society now issues the American medal, but that's only been in the last two years. The British paid for that medal and shipped it across the pond and we gave it to whichever ones the Iris Society picked. But now they said, you know, these things are getting costly. If y'all are gonna keep this up, why don't y'all do it? You've got a bigger group than we do. So now the American Iris Society provides it. Now we'll throw in this. France also got one starting in 28, but they stopped in 38 and I have no idea what the French were thinking. Okay, so we'll just move on. Catherine Dykes, meanwhile, carries on her husband's business in plant breeding, and in 1926, okay, this next year, she named the first true yellow iris ever William R. Dykes in his memory. Isn't that cool? Now, sadly, Catherine Dykes died in 1933 in a train accident. <laughs> I hope none of this is related to loving irises. I mean, I just can't. I know. I know. Okay, folks. Now, how does the American Iris Society select this particular award? Okay. It's going to get complicated. Ask questions. Okay, the candidates for the American Iris Society Award are bred by, have to be bred by, North American breeders. Okay, so Canadians are in this too if they don't live up too far north where they can't grow irises. They're, they're kind of limited up there. Okay, and the irises are eligible two years after it went, now look at this, the top medal for its class. Top medal for its class, explain that, Pug. Okay, for instance, here's an example. I have this really cool iris I like and I'm gonna get hold of it. Doris, I hope you can get hold of it too. Don't doubt Dalton, okay? It was the Worcester Award winner for tall bearded irises, I'm translating okay, in 2021, which means in 2023, it gets considered for the Dykes Medal because it's two years after it won the top award in its class. Okay, everybody, you're with me? Yes. Where did it win the award from? Oh, it'll come straight from the American Iris Society, and I think there is a big ceremony when they hand it out. Okay, y'all want to see Don't Doubt Dalton? Yeah. I am cheering for it because the guy that made it is Tom Bursine, and I've actually met the dude. He is so daggum nice. He's a Texas hybridizer in Grand Prairie, and this flower is gorgeous. Oh. oh. Oh, go, don't doubt Dalton, I'm cheering for it. Okay, 
Now it gets a little more it gets a little more tricky here. There are three American Iris Society awards annually for tall bearded irises. They call them the Wister Awards. Now, y'all got a little piece of paper. I hope you've got a piece of paper. Types of bearded irises. Oh yeah, oh yeah, right, right here. Sandra, you need one? <laughs> okay, the back in the corner. Dr. Harper's tardy, but we'll let her come. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, <laughs> just call her out. <laughs> okay, everybody okay on this now? Over there in the corner, yeah. Okay, tall bearded irises. Okay, everybody ready? This is gonna get complicated. Tall bearded irises, the best are called the Wister Award. Okay, Wister. Okay, the tall bearded irises, there are three Wister Awards given every year. Three tall bearded irises. So don't doubt Dalton automatically as competition from two other tall bearded irises, thinking they're gonna win that award. Okay, the other 14 categories have only one winner. Okay, now wait a minute. I'm gonna go ahead and show this slide and then we'll talk. What? <laughs> Does this mean there are 15 categories of irises? At least. Okay, now. Okay, so go with me slow and let's, let's make sure we get this. I want to show you the awards given by, okay, starting with height for bearded irises. And everybody understand what the beard is on an iris. Yeah, it's this little thing right there and right there and right there. Okay, bearded irises. Irises that are considered actually 27 and a half inches or taller are considered tall bearded. Well, what if mine doesn't grow that big and it's supposed to be a tall bearded? I'm just gonna say, welcome to West Texas. Okay, yeah, y'all. But that's the, the variety, okay, they. This one, border bearded, is somewhere around 16 to 27. This is, okay, right here, miniature tall bearded. Does that sound like an oxymoron to you? A miniature tall bearded. But what it's saying is it has every property of a tall bearded, but it's just smaller. Think dog shows. Okay, you know, you got the little toy ones and the little miniature ones and you got the big ones. Okay, same thing's happening with irises and the hybridization of them. Okay, intermediates are 15 to 28, but they start looking a little different. And then down here, you've got the standard dwarf bearded, which only stands eight to 15 inches tall. And now a miniature dwarf bearded that is only eight inches tall. Okay, are you kind of with me on the different types based on their height and what they're breeding? Because sometimes what happened, honestly, y'all, and probably with the dogs too, they bred something together and the runts showed up, but they were cute. <laughs> and they said, oh, let's get some more runts and breed them together. And pretty soon we got a bunch of cute little things. So tall bearded has ruled the iris world up until about the 40s and 50s and they all started really playing around with the size of them. And now there's all these. But right now, Dykes Medals, okay, Dykes Medals, 87 have been given in the United States and 83 went to tall bearded. Because people like the big ones, okay? You know, it's good. Okay, one border bearded has won. Okay, one miniature, okay, tall bearded, and then one intermediate bearded. None of these have won yet. Now you're adding those up, 83, 84, 85, 86, Pug, I thought you said there were 87. Okay, now get this, this is where it's really mind blowing. Okay, these are just the bearded irises. Oh, there's a whole bunch of other ones that don't have beards. Okay, you ready? Can y'all handle the truth? Okay, here we go. All right, so in the United States, bearded irises alone, there are 70,000 registered bearded irises. So when y'all send me a picture on Facebook and say, oh, Pug, this is blooming in my yard, what is it? And I go, it appears to be annoyed. And I don't mean annoyed at you. It's an N-O-I-D, meaning it has no ID. I am clueless. I don't know 70,000 irises. I mean, I can narrow it down a little bit, but do y'all see how easy it is to have in your own yards a bunch of noids? Okay.
If they have beards and you can't name them, it's probably annoyed. Okay, now, here are the 15 categories. Start up here at the top and realize that the American Dykes Award is chosen as the best from all those different categories. And tall bearded, which down here at the bottom, the Worcester Award, they give three of them every year because there's so many of them being hybridized. Okay, everybody with me? So, there's been at least one of this miniature tall, one of the intermediates, right here, one of the best borders, and then this one right here, time out, it's the best Siberian iris. Well, that screwed up my garden at home <laughs> because, okay, it's not Siberia, Siberia, but it is kind of it's, it's Eastern Asia and Western Europe, and it grows better in North Italy and in Turkey and in the Ukraine. It doesn't grow real good in Abilene. <laughs> and it would be 2016. That's the year our granddaughter was born. And I'm looking at Swanson Flight, and I am nurturing, and, and she's bloomed. She has bloomed. But she just doesn't bloom at the time with the others because she's used to different climates. Yeah, okay. Now, so y'all see how all of this gets real convoluted on the type of irises. Because people want to walk out there and see a beard on an iris and it be tall. And lo and behold, if we do a Dykes Metal Garden, not all of them are going to be tall, and there's at least one that doesn't have a beard, and that's swans in flight. All right, there she is, the Siberian iris. I really thought, are they growing irises in Siberia? I mean, I researched this one, y'all. I don't know why they called it that. Now, back to, back to the Dykes Award. <laughs> I'll get back on track here. Only... American Iris Society registered judges are going to vote on it. So that's who decides. All right. It now takes about seven years to achieve a Dykes Medal. From start to finish, seven. And I think if you'll look at my slides here in a minute, there was one of them that was introduced and it was 11 years before it won. So, you know, the hybridizers have to be kind of patient and keep it going. And Iris can compete for three years. But if you haven't won it by the third time, you're done. That's it. Yeah, your price just dropped on the market, okay? <laughs> anyway, some years, no winner is chosen because of a lack of qualified applicants. Okay, now I will show you what's happened on that. The Dykes Medal was first awarded in North America in 1927, asterisk. Wouldn't it have been perfect if it had been 1923, the year that McMurray was founded? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be nice. But life is not perfect, okay? Iris Society itself started in 1920. William Dykes died in 25, 26. They start the award, and the first one given in the U.S. is 1927, which is pretty close. You got to admit, pretty close. All right. Those are the 10 years with no Dykes selection. And you can kind of look at that and go, okay, they had a tough time in the 30s getting everybody to enter. But it picked up really good. I was always disappointed at nothing in 69 because that was the year I graduated from high school. And then weren't we all kind of upset in 2020? But let me have the little bouncing star come up here for that because they decided to make up for it by giving two awards in 21. So when I say there's only one national champion, I'm actually lying, except for the year 2021 when they gave two. But it's to make up for the COVID spring. Okay, ready? Y'all ready? Y'all are a good audience. Now, I want to introduce you to the members of the Centennial Iris Garden. This is so exciting. Okay, but have y'all seen that? Okay, yeah, okay, there. We're going to look at that again. Okay, a little reverse timeline. <clears throat> if you want flowers to bloom in April of 2023, because that's the magic year, you've got to get them planted early. So there's going to be a dedication on April 29th, and, and we had to get them planted. I knew we needed to get them six weeks before the first frost. So they had to be done pretty quick, and that was on September 17th. So actually the first official centennial event happened before they started the centennial events, which was the next week, right? <laughs> yeah, so we were first. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Now, from there, ordering and the preparation of the rhizomes had to happen before that date. 
Okay, you're going, oh, so you just called a you know, guy and they sent him, oh. <laughs> Ricky, shake your head, no way. I can't, <laughs> ordering these irises, I had a list of approximately 50 dealers that I felt like were pretty reliable. I already, already found one that wasn't and I marked them off my list. But I had a, a, a list of 50 and I start looking at their websites and I'm trying to figure out when they open their sales. Some sales open on January 1. So I had to start ordering then. One, Sherry, we're going to tell them our story, okay? You got to vouch for me on this one, authenticity. I was looking for Skywatch. Skywatch was available at Breezeway. Breezeway doesn't open till May 1. Okay, so I've gotten pretty much everything sort of ordered except Skywatch. Now, I knew from the previous year when I needed Mary Randall that they are serious about saying it opens at a certain time, but I didn't know what the time was. It says May 1. The previous year, I thought that means 8 o'clock, business hours, right? By the time I logged on at 8 o'clock, everything was sold. Yeah. Sherry Widmar is at my house spending the night at my house on the eve of May 1. And I am at the computer practicing logging into Breezeway to see how quickly I can do it from 11.30 to midnight. I have got it down to about 30 seconds. And click, I watch the universal time roll over. I am logging in. I, it's no, Sherry, how long did it take me, really? 15 seconds. Uh, there you go. And it was sold out. Oh. <laughs> I think there was some insider trading. <laughs> I do. I was so crushed. I can't find that one anywhere else. I can't find it. So anyway, ordering and preparation of rice homes gets interesting. Oh, does it ever. Okay. <laughs> Installation meant garden, soil, and fertilizer. That had to be done too. You don't have all these irises just stored in Ricky's shop without doing something with them. Right, Ricky? Okay. All right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the garden design came up. That was previous to that. We said ADA accessibility. The location actually was over where that old cactus rock garden was. And if that breaks your heart, I'm sorry. But it had snakes and scorpions and stuff. And it, 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 just, it needed to be gone. It wasn't safe. There was no ADA anything safe on it. Okay, It needed to be done away with. So got, we saw three or four different designs. And we picked the one that made it. And then all of it started with this, the purpose of honoring a tradition, because all of you in this room know it hurts to lose a tradition. And the pain had gone on long enough and I knew I got to do something. Now, when TP Village disappeared, I got all sorts of calls. And people are saying, you know, Peg, what are we going to do about TP Village? And my reply was, I'm already growing as many irises as I can. I don't have room for teepees. I don't have room in my yard. I don't have it. So I'm doing my best with the irises. Now, when McMurray was created in 1923, that was certainly not perfect timing because there was about to be a Great Depression. You know, you're going to build a school. Way to go, J.W. Hunt. You know, you're dreaming your vision, and then you're going to have this major economic crash. We're going to create an iris garden during the summer of 2022 where it's the hottest temperatures. We are 11 inches below our annual rainfall and I'm getting irises that I ordered in you know, January, sent to my house in June, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, I hate to do this to you, but you're going to have to go in a pot, you know, because I'm afraid to leave them in the shop because they're going to roast, right? So there's nothing perfect about the timing of McMurray University nor the Iris Garden, but boy, are the challenges interesting. <laughs> okay, here's the garden, the uh, architect's drawing. You will notice that they've taken out all the businesses and residences across the street on sales. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I look forward to that clear view. <laughs> but this is the entrance coming from Martin Residence Hall. Okay, right up there, and that is where pretty much that, that old rock garden was. Okay, those are trees that exist there now, and then you see kind of the drone view. The shrubbery around there represents um, something that's going to stay green year-round, hopefully. Good luck. It's already experienced some of Texas weather. But it'll provide greenery because the irises are going to bloom in April. Right. Well, a few of them in March, and some of them hang over to May, but rarely do they stay till Mother's Day. They're usually through by then. Okay, the area in the center that just kind of has that little wispy thing, it's a sculpture 
of an iris. <laughs> and the dude that's doing it's the same one that did Grant Taff. Oh, oh come on, come on, go. Oh, uh, yeah, and yeah, that's going to be fun. Okay, now this, <laughs> oh, this is what I've been dealing with. This is the plots looking toward the entrance, Martin Hall, back here. And I'm looking at, okay, if we're going to put them in here, what I loved about the old iris garden was it was a progression of botanical success. You saw the plain ones, the plain ones, the plain ones, the prettier ones. Oh, look, they're better stems. Oh my gosh, ruffles, two tones. When will they have a black iris? And now it's, when will they have red? And the red ones, they're getting close, but it's not fire engine red yet. And the blacks are really dark purple. Okay. <laughs> Don't tell them that, okay, but yeah. All right, so I said, let's just read it from left to right. And we'll just go through here. And so we've got 80 plots in the iris garden. Everybody okay with that? Good, me too. I was really excited when they finally put the forms down. I was really excited when the rebar went in and the concrete started going in, and I was so pleased. I mean, they brought the concrete. Look at this thing. I mean, they were out there, and there's nobody's name scratched in the concrete. I, how did that happen? How did that happen? It's wonderful. <laughs> and then this happened. Now, this is McMurray Maintenance helping me put the topsoil in, till it up, and get it ready for the planting. Okay, that's not in their job description because the landscaping at McMurray is outsourced to another group. They've been kind. They have brought me orthene when I've discovered, you know, fire ants. And, and they've helped a great deal, but it's not in their contract right now. So hold that thought. Some people have guardian angels. I had garden angels. These are the guys that came to do it. Now, this is what happened at home. If the iris arrived in June or July, I put it in a pot. Okay, that's not all of them. That's just two sides of the house, okay? That worked really well until August 27, when we had that night four inches of rain and it drowned all of those and I am draining them carefully the next day saying I'm so sorry I didn't mean to, to do this to you without teaching you how to swim you know <laughs> and then there were some that came in August because I had friends that understood this I had good friends in Georgia Mary Hess God love this woman I'm emailing her back and forth about this one particular one and she said well how hot is it there and I told her about it and she said oh honey I didn't know you were living in hell. No. <laughs> well, yeah, welcome to my world, Mary. But they all said, we'll send them to you after Labor Day. And I'm like, well, that's good. Don't take them out of the ground until you have to. Clean them off, bleach them like you're supposed to, meet all that, you know, travel stuff. Send them to my house. And then I put them in sacks. The other ones on those sacks are the ones I dug up from my yard. And I waited to the last minute to dig them up because it's sort of like, I'm not sure how this is going to work. It's as hard for me as it is for you. <laughs> yep, shake it off, put them in the sack, and identify all the sacks. And um, at this point, we started loading them in the pickup to bring them up to McMurray. And that is Ricky looking very smug because he finally got his shop back after having irises all in it for the whole summer. It was it, it was brutal, wasn't it, Rick? Yeah. <laughs> but we got them all in two vehicles and brought them up to McMurray. Murray to have this event on September 17th and I can only tell you that the blessing of the rhizomes and the planning of the rhizomes exceeded expectations because when I looked at the people that came at first I thought oh they're just here to watch us all get down on our hands and knees and plant these things but we'd laid them all out in the areas where they were supposed to be and I'd pretty much threaten people you plant this thing in the right area because I can't tell by looking at the rhizome you know what it's going to be until it blooms so plant it in the right area check the map and everybody was looking at their map and doing their thing and that's Jared Hart the MSG president Mike Hutchison VP for institutional advancement there's Dr. Sandra Harper. There, there you are, Joe. I love it, Joe Jr. And I'm on the end, and we're planting our rhizomes. We did the first planting. 
And then I invited the people to come out and start planting. And I remember I had to turn around to talk to somebody from the Abilene Reporter News. And when I turned back around, this is happening. I mean, there are people that are going after it. Ah, there's Mike and Jarrett planting. Yeah, right there. And by the way, that's what an Irish rhizome looks like. There's some in the pot. You had Ramses, huh, Joe Jr.? I see you got that one. Yeah, I had Sierra Blue next there. And there is Sandra Harper taking a picture of Cindy Kwai. And so all of y'all over there laugh because guess what Cindy Kwai planted? Drama queen. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Priceless, priceless. You could you can't make this up. That's the beautiful watering of Diane Doolin. Yeah, coming to help that day. Loved it so much. I was, I mean, I just thought festive was the word. And there it is, all the little irises getting in there. Oh, and then my favorite picture, Terry and James Falkenberry brought the three Abilene grandchildren. And so there's Taylor Tatum and Tucker. And look at that little watering pot he's got. <laughs> and you've been back three times. And you've been back three times to check on little, with our two little Splash Akata, number 61. 61. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know which one you got. I mean, literally, and when, when, the Caroline started playing. I mean, I could have just raptured right there. Just boom, I'm out of here. But God said, no, you got to finish working the iris garden. Okay, so the math for our garden. There are 96 years of Dykes medals in the U.S. Bobble your heads. Let's do the math. Okay, minus nine for the years. Okay, no Dykes medals. So there's 87 available. But we have 80 spots. The spots are 2.5 by 3 feet out there. So they're, they're going to grow and expand, not by April. Give them a couple of years, okay? <laughs> they'll, they'll grow and expand and fill those spots. So we have 80 spots, which means, okay, there's 87 available Dykes medals. What are you going to do with those other seven? Y'all, I can't find them all. They're, I've tried. I, remember a sky watch? I have tried. I have tried. But here's what I'm planning right now. Space number one and 80 on your map, the Alpha and the Omega, they're special, okay? So minus two, there's 78 spots available now. Three, I was not able to have ready for planting. That's amethyst flame, pink taffeta. They were at my house. I did not order any more because I thought I would have enough. Amethyst flame has baked in the soil. I mean, it's gone. I'm going to have to order amethyst flame all over again. Pink taffeta, on the other hand, has kind of sprung back up. And if I can kind of check on when frost is going to happen, you may just have a pink taffeta appear out there. You, you Hang on. But the 2022 award was not even named at that time. Okay, now, minus one for 2023, because that's going to be the last Dykes medal in the Centennial Garden. And we don't even know who what that one is yet. So with all this math going on, it meant that there were 74 places for us to plant on September 17th. 74 out of 80. So it's pretty much filled, which I'm sorry, I, in my mind, I'm going, this was kind of like a miracle. Yeah, this was, this is fish and loaves thing. This was big. Okay, there's a 50% bloom rate for first time rhizomes. So if you're expecting 74 blooms out there in April, be realistic, 37, it's gonna be a little more like it. Now with that in mind, okay, there's the numbers. Number one and number 80 are gonna be special. Do, do, do. Real special. Weather is a huge factor in bloom rate. I wanna show y'all something. Everybody that gardens know what this is. The hardiness zones. Yeah. Okay, Abilene is sitting right in here in 8A. Thank goodness we're not 8B. Okay, we are like a Italian. Why do you not see irises in Houston, San Antonio? Uh-uh. When you get down here, they're not going to grow. It's too humid. Basically, four for tall bearded, four to eight and 8B is stretching it, 8A is right on the edge. Okay, so if you have friends that say, well, I can't get them to grow in Houston, <laughs> you could just say, well, I don't know what you're doing wrong. <laughs> but, okay, but listen to what kind of tricks I was doing on these irises. We throw them all out there in the ground on September 17th. My suppliers are from Wisconsin. 
<laughs> Oregon, Washington, the mountains of California. I got a lady over in Georgia. I got a guy in West Virginia. I even got some from New Jersey. Who'd have thunk? Okay. They come to West Texas and we just pop them in the ground and say, good luck. And a lot of them have said, no, I think I'm just going to roast. And a lot of them have not made it. They have not made it. Now, it's not because of the lack of water, because we keep going out there to water. <sighs> but there's some that are going to make it, I can tell you today. I checked today, and there's new growth on some of them. When you can see coming from the soil, that new little green, oh, it's just like, you know, oh, yeah, I know, babies. I know, little babies coming. Okay, here they are. I want you to meet the irises of the McMurray Centennial Iris Garden. Here we go. Except for two categories, they're all the national champions. Noteworthy thoughts. I'm making you hold your breath. Registration and introduction has greatly changed through the years. Some irises that were registered in 1927 were eligible for the award in 1927. Now they have to wait a long time. Registration for all non-bulbous irises in the world is done with the American Iris Society. Those are the ones that have rhizomes, okay? And if they've got other kind of bulb things, then they're in another Iris Society. Okay. Iris names are very important. We can't duplicate Dr. Joe. It's already been registered once. We can't do that again. Hybridizers, and I'm going to show you their name, are extremely important. Doris, look for a certain last name. Okay, it's going to crop up here that you've heard speak at a meeting not too long ago. Okay. <laughs> All right. William R. Dykes was introduced in 1926, the year after his death. It was considered the first true yellow. Promptly one of the best sellers for the next two decades. Yellow color with purple streaks, and it's going to be in space number one because I got it in August. I got two of them. <laughs> now, they're not in the garden yet. I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, just they're encouraging in them in my home in the backyard where it's safe from the dogs. Okay, there we go. So here is what WR Docs looks like. Ooh, there you go, everybody. So now let's see the very first Docs winner, 1927. Oh, San Francisco. Woo. Dauntless in 29. Ramses in 32. And yes, these pictures are from my yard. Yes, they are. Okay, all but a few of them. Sierra Blue, 1935. How about, I love this one, Mary Geddes. Isn't she cute? I have awards that I give for Facebook competition among my irises, and she got Rookie of the Year the first year she bloomed. She's so beautiful. Mary Geddes. Aha! Missouri. Just looks like the typical iris. You know, you'd use it for an illustration all the time. 39, Rosie Wings. Aha! 40. Wabash. Wabash is considered like if you're a collector of historic irises, you get Wabash. Okay, here we go. 42, Great Lakes. 43, Prairie Sunset. 45, Elmore. Time out. If you haven't started doing this, what is wrong with you? I look at those years and go, that's the one that won that year? This is the one that won the year my dad graduated from high school. Of course I wanted Elmore. Of course I did. All right, 47, Chivalry. Are you feeling it? 48, Mom graduated from college. You go, girl. You and your three sisters all went to college. Yes. Helen McGregor in 49. 50, Blue Rhythm. Okay, group. 51, your birth year. I know y'all. And, and I have to tell the story because I said Sherry, because that's my friend Sherry, but it's really the French version. It's Cherie. So when I'm around Irish people, I'm supposed to say Cherie, but when I'm around you, I say Sherry. There she is, 51. 53, truly yours. Oh, let me tell you this one. Who it's for, particularly, Melissa Pilcher, oh. because Ben Pilcher brought this one home and they planted it and grew it in Abilene. And that's for Melissa right now, the late Ben Pilcher. Isn't that beautiful? They started getting the darker colors now. Yeah, you're going, yeah, somebody was doing a good job. <laughs> this one, 57, Violet Harmony. 55, Blue Sapphire, I love this one. 
look, you can hardly see it, but the thickness of that stalk, if she's going to grow that tall, it's got to have support. She was in the west wind. Y'all remember March and April? Oh, I'm running around with rebar, propping up all these irises. Blue sapphires just like try to knock me That's over. Right. And I actually think, I'll be talking to some hybridizers about this, the 50s irises are tougher. They can hold those heads up good because when the heads got bigger as they went on, the stems weren't big enough and they were crashing all over the place. So there's kind of a trade out when you hybridize just to get the flower. All right, got to get a good stalk too. Swan Ballet in 59. Are you loving these? Eleanor's Pride in 61. Whole Cloth 62. Ah, this one. It won in 63, but it will come in 2024 to the garden because it baked in my yard. Sorry, it was bad. Pacific Panorama, 65. Rippling Waters, just a lavender tint to it in 66. Winter Olympics, yeah, aha. And this one. This is the one that Dr. Joe showed me and the very first iris that I spent money on after getting his rhizomes for years and kind of going around. But when I said, I got to have one, it was that one right there. Now, look at who was the hybridizer. Hold that name, Shriner. Hold, just hold that thought. Okay, we're continuing on. Debbie Raritan. By the way, a grandmother went to a meeting. They talked about how to hybridize, and she goes, that's easy. So she started and she put together some seedlings for the next year and one of them actually was strong enough to kind of make it through and then she grew it and it was beautiful and her friend said, let's see if we can spread it around and get some people interested. She entered the competition one time and won the Dykes Award with a, with a flower named for her granddaughter. Aww. Aww, I love it. Babbling Brook in 72. 73, new moon. Who's going to be here for the class of 73's reunion next year, all of us that graduated in 73? Are we lucky? We got to be turning 50 with our class the year McMurray will turn 100. We did not appreciate it when we were here and realized that we were, oh, we're the, you know, this graduating class, really cool. No, we, we know now how cool it was. All right, ship shape, 74. Uh huh. Pink taffeta. She's coming in 2024 unless I can sneak some in before frost and get her with rooted beforehand. Okay, I've got a few in my yard. Dream Lover 77. Bride's Halo 78. Mary Frances. I always feel like I have to show two of them. Mary and Frances. Okay, yeah. Mary Frances. Mystique in 1980. That beautiful coloring. And this one. Da 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 da. Not a tall bearded. The very first one to win the award that wasn't a TB. It's a border bearded. And she's beautiful. She's in my backyard. Vanity. Is that a beautiful pink? Yes. All right. Ruffled Ballet. Victoria Falls. Beverly Seals. Yeah. Did y'all know Beverly Seals' his daughter was deaf? and never heard her mother sing? No. Well, there's a little trivia for you. Okay, I'm right, all right, Carl, okay, all right. 1986 Song of Norway. I was so thrilled when she bloomed this year because I'd had her in the yard for three years. It's like she was playing hard to get. And then when she bloomed, I went, darling, you're gorgeous. Come on out, yeah, you're beautiful. I regret that I do not have a ruler to show you how large that one is. Now these are called standards, the three going up, and then there's three, one on the back side going down. That thing covers your whole hand. It is Titan's glory rocks, okay, it, it's huge. Beautiful coloring. Jesse's song, kind of cute over there. Everything Plus, I took that one from up above to get that one. Dusky Challenger is the offspring of Titan's glory. Yeah. Hi, Dad. She waves across the, you know, flower bed. All right. Edith Wolford. Edith. Okay, now look right here. 
take a look at this one right here. What you're seeing up here are three canvases that I made of flowers this last year. And these are going to be auctioned off, silent auction, in the spring to help benefit the Iris Garden Endowment. So there's Edith, and y'all just think how pretty she'd look on your wall. And yes, it would be worth it. All right, there she is blooming. Beautiful. Silverado. Honky Tonk Blues. Don't you love the names? Do they come up with great ones? Yeah. Before the Storm. Now that is considered pretty much one of the first blacks. But if you look real close, you can tell it's really deep, deep, deep purple. Okay, Before the Storm. Thornbirds. Observe. This does not look like a beard. It's got a start of a beard and then a horn or something. This is what they call the space age irises. They went crazy with deformities on the beards and said, let's keep breeding until we see how weird we can get a beard to be. Okay? And there's flounces, there's horns, there's, oh my gosh, these prick things. But they're not always beards anymore. And I'll show you a beautiful one here in a minute. Conjuration. Oh, she looks so good against that, like a good deep green tree behind her. Yeah, she's beautiful. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Ah, uh, Shriner, you caught the name, Bob. <laughs> yeah, and when you look at how the sun is shining, you go, it's really a deep, deep, deep purple. But isn't that beautiful? All right, stairway to heaven. You cannot get the full effect of this without looking down here. This one stem has seven irises coming off of it. It's like a spiral staircase. Yeah, it just doesn't quit blooming. Once it starts, it's going for it. Yaquina Blue, Yaquina Valley in Oregon, where some of the larger irises are grown. Mesmerizer, time out. Look right here. See Mesmerizer? Okay. Now, catch this. You're going to get it now. There's the standards. Fall, fall. That is a space age flounce. That beard went poof. Is that gorgeous? Yeah, I've got her in the backyard for protection. Yeah, yeah, she's you there. Painted all those? Hmm? You painted all those? I didn't paint. I just took their picture. Ask me about my camera. What about your camera? It's an iPhone. <laughs> what I did was put craft foam behind it, caught it in good light. That, that nothing beats sunlight. Okay. Nothing beats sunlight. And just took pictures of them. Now, we got to talk about what is a historic iris. Because all of the ones you've seen to this date meet the criteria. If they were introduced over 30 years ago, they're called historic. So what does that make all of us? <laughs> okay, <laughs> really historic. Okay, all right. They've survived their time period. They're still in production. They're the toughest plants of their generation. Why would you want to collect older irises? Well, I've got some reasons why you need to collect older irises. Number one, promote the evolution of the modern iris. You don't know where you are unless you look back at where you've been. Preference for a simpler form. Some homes need to have antique irises around them. Swinson House in Abilene is one. Preservation of history. Can I get a witness? I'm not canceling out irises just because they're old. No, they existed. We're going to keep them around. And with the Dykes medals, you can celebrate milestones in your life. That's why you want historic irises. Now, the rest of these are considered modern, but they're going to be historic. Celebration song will be there next year. OK, you're about to become an old lady. Yeah, 2003. Crowned heads in 04. 05, Splash Chicago, Terry's favorite. Welcome, everyone. Sea power, look at the ruffles. Isn't that great? Queen Circle, 08. Star Woman, who was the second non-tall bearded. She's an intermediate. All right, she's cute, too. Golden Panther. Ricky, we like Golden Panther. We keep her right by the back door, yeah. Paul Black, Cindy Pickett, Kwai's favorite, drama queen. <laughs> all right, Florentine Silk. That's all, folks. Isn't that, don't you just want like Porky Pig and Daffy Duck? Yeah. Da -da 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 -da. This one, dividing line is a miniature tall bearded. It looks like a little herd of butterflies when they all bloom. They're tiny and they, they're thick as can be. Oh, it's wonderful. Here we go, Gypsy Lord. Look at that orange beard. 
And then there she is, straight from Siberia. That is Swanson Flight. That is my backyard. She has bloomed two years, but she's going to look dead at times that the others look alive. Okay, go with it. Mm. Ah, Montmartre, oh. Marmar, if you're French. She's beautiful. How about this one? Haunted Heart. When she's a bud, I swear she looks like a dirty dish rag. Mm -hmm. But when she opens up, I'm going ballet folklorico. Yeah. It is yeah. rocking. Yeah. All right, 2019 bottle rocket. Oh, and then 21 because we didn't have them in 20. So appearing now, daring deception, and we have her planted. She's she's there. And then the second one for 2021. Look at that one. Wow. Reckless abandon. Wow. Oh, y'all have got the y'all got the right oh you got the hearts for irises i love it 2022 was named she's not in there yet because i'm gonna have to order her. there's football hero and then who will occupy space number 79 well we don't know because that's going to be decided but we do know that number 80 at the end is dr norlin henderson and I hope that we can contact members of his family and invite them to come to the dedication. Now, with that said, still on the to-do list, we're going to do Adopt-A-Bed where y'all help me come weed it, okay? I'm having war with the Bermuda grass. I'm going to win. Bermuda grass doesn't have a chance, but it thinks it does. We're going to have to winterize it. We'll, we'll put chicken manure out there to kind of winterize it. We're going to number the spots. We're going to have QR codes so that you can use your phone to find out the names of all the irises as you go through. Oh, yeah. Okay. We got to do spring prep work before they bloom in, in April. And then we got to raise funds. Pregnant pause for drama. <laughs> Things like this don't happen by accident. They happen by love. Okay. So, y'all reach down deep okay I'll de keep digging deeper you keep reaching down deeper and how did I get involved in this project well this is quick I've been working in the yard since 1954 okay that's me and my dad he, he showed me how to help him mow I sat on the steps of Radford like this pledge class did this was 73's pledge class yeah okay three three okay and I have managed to keep some alive in my yard, and I'm really proud of that. I mean, they have entertained us, kept us going. During COVID lockdown, the irises were the delight. To the extent that I have joined uh, now the iris group, I've got over 140 varieties in my yard, 82 of the 87 Dykes medals in my yard. And now the Historic Iris Preservation Society nationally recognizes my yard as a display garden. So, yeah, yeah! <laughs> When it gets cold, I love them so much that I run out and I put sacks over the little buds. <laughs> and when it is hot, this how many of these do we have, Ricky? 25? We put screens in front of them on the southwest sun just to give them some break from the other side. So all I can tell you is that my resume now includes all these things. And I thought my resume was finished when I left McMurray. I've done these things in only a year and a half. But of the national recognition for educational display, that was a, a scientific, you know, like science fair project. We put it up, and I did it on the upcoming McMurray Iris Garden. National office recognized it. Yeah. But here's the big one. Here's the big one. They come up to me at the state meeting that we just finished in August. And lady that I met at HICO, because I drive to HICO for Iris Society meetings, because you can always go eat at the coffee cup afterwards. But And I'm talking to Del Perry, and she had just knocked it out of the ballpark with first, second, and third overall irises in the show at HICO. And she's telling me in August, going, you need to become a judge for the American Iris Society. And I said, seriously, Dell, my resume is complete. I don't need anything else on my resume. And she said the magic words, you can judge the Dykes medal. <laughs> reeled me in. The process will take three to seven years. You have to do all sorts of coursework and you've got to apprentice for a long time. But when she said you could vote for the Dykes medal, I remember thinking, oh, put that on the resume. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all about mentoring and sharing the love. And I am so glad that 
Dr. Norlin Henderson shared it with Joe Humphrey, and I'm glad that all of you have experienced it. So share the love, and let's keep the Iris Garden going at McMurray. Thank you. Thank you.